Good morning to all, and a welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning, whether you're gathered here in the hall or watching at home online, we pray God's blessing upon you each uh, today. If you're visiting, if it's your first visit, you are especially welcome. Just a polite reminder, again, that your mobile phones must be switched off or on aeroplane mode. You see you're all diving in your handbags and pockets. I've checked mine. And uh, that does help to ensure that the live stream runs a little more smoothly. Thank you for those of you who've sponsored our youth and young people who are going to the Christian Arts Week in Harrogate this year. A phenomenal amount of money has been donated or promised. It's not too late if you wish to sponsor or make donation towards what is a very expensive week for our young people. We have 12 going uh, to ISCA, that's the Yorkshire School of Christian Arts, and uh, we know they'll have a wonderful time. If you want to make a contribution to help them, that'll be great. I have it on good authority. Lieutenant Stephanie White has arrived in Water Beach. Mum's been to check and unpack some boxes, and next weekend, Steph will be installed and welcomed as the new commanding officer at Water Beach Corps. Steph, if you're watching or listening, we pray God's blessing upon you today in readiness for next weekend. May you have a good week, and the Lord bless you. In the absence of Alan and Althea, who are enjoying a lovely week somewhere on the Gower coast, I think, I did think we should have had a core outing tomorrow and go and join them if the weather's like this. But in that absence, Teresa is going to lead us in our worship today. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. It's good to greet you this morning and to be able to come and lead our worship this morning. And to do that, I want to share, first of all, some words to bring us into our time of worship this morning. Sing praises to the Lord God Almighty and give thanks to God's holy name. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The stone the builders rejected has become the foundation of our lives. We sing praise to God who gives water as a gift from the river of life. This is the word for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All who are thirsty, come to the life-giving water. Come to the river of life. Be refreshed and renewed, even restored. We give thanks to you, O God, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Blessed be you, river of life. I'm going to invite you to stand and to lift your hearts, to lift our hearts in adoration and praise as we listen or if we're at home, we can sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Let's stand, please.
to take your seat. If only we could have expressed that verbally. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. But I hope you felt it in here. I hope you felt it here and the presence of God this morning. The psalmist in Psalm 42 said, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The psalmist knew something of the holiness of God. And he longed to be in the presence of the living God. He longed to be deep within the love of God. As the deer pants for the water, his soul longed to be in the presence of God. May we today long to be immersed fully ourselves within that love and that loving presence of the living God through the Holy Spirit. We're going to listen to Helen Mark as they sing this song as the deer, um, which leads us into our prayer time. And then Stuart Miskin is going to uh, pray a prayer that's already been recorded and will come for us on the screen. Thank you.
Shall we pray? Lord, we come into your presence this morning with the desire in our hearts to know you more, to understand your love in a greater way, and to fully learn, learn about your desire for our lives and the people we touch in our everyday living. We have so much to thank you for, and yet at times we can get so engaged with the ways of the world that we fail to see you in our everyday lives. We want this morning, Father, to learn even more about you and your love for us. Our desire is that we leave this place better fitted to serve you because we gain a better understanding of your love and how that love must be taken out into a world that is crying out for hope and purpose. To do that, O oh God, we need to have our own personal experience of you and your love. Only as I truly know thee, can I make thee truly known. Only bring the power to others, which in my own life is shown. Lord, lead us into that place of great understanding and clarity of our service for you. May we be so filled with your love that it flows out from us into every situation that we find ourselves in, so that in every moment of our living, we mirror your beauty, love and grace. Whether we are worshipping live at the hall this morning or watching this service from our homes, we know you are there just wanting us to embrace your love even more. Touch each one of us, Lord. Use each one of us. Light us up with your love and power. Use each one of us to show a hurting world that there is hope, there is purpose, there is something worth living for. Show thy power in me. Show thy power in me that I may be used for others. Show thy power in me. Teach us, Lord, and use us. Amen. Amen, indeed. To those prayers that we prayed in our own heart and for the prayer that was expressed on our behalf. Now, young people, I'm sorry, but I don't have any marvellous experiment for you this morning like Captain Allen usually has. But I want to talk to you about swimming. I wonder, do we have any good swimmers here this morning? We've got a yeah, we've got one or two hands up here this morning. And some of our young people, you may still be learning to swim. I don't know whether Grace still has to have armbands and floats or whether you can... No, you're like a little fish. Fabulous. All right. But for learners, you have armbands and floats to help keep you safe, to help keep you afloat. And some of you older young people may be really good swimmers and go right up to the deep end in the swimming pool. So how deep can you swim? That's a question for us this morning. I wonder if any people in our congregation this morning have actually snorkeled. Any been, anybody been snorkeling? Yeah, one or two? Great. Uh, looking at the fish and sea creatures. I've never done it myself, but it must be a marvelous experience. Have any of you been scuba diving? Anyone in the congregation been scuba diving? Yeah, fabulous. You can go even deeper into the water with the aid of a breathing apparatus to give you air. Anybody really good at diving? Oh, Graces, yeah, I can see a few at the back here, fabulous. <coughs> Well, when you jump off the diving board and enter the water, you usually go down quite deeply before coming up to the surface. I have to admit, it's a long time since I did that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's better, I hope. But how deep? How deep can you really go when you're swimming? Here's a picture of a baby swimming. If we can go back to that, that's it. That baby is swimming underwater. And um, maybe some of our children have been able to do that. No special equipment was needed here. The next picture 
is a picture of a free diver. <clears throat> okay. There are some people who dive deep without the aid of breathing apparatus on their back. They're called free divers. They hold their breath for many, many minutes. Now, the record free diver for holding their breath goes to a German gentleman called Tom Cetus, who held his breath for just over 22 minutes in 2012. So, if you get a bit bored this morning and you want something to do, time yourself. See how long you can hold your breath for, okay? Now, the next picture. Going deep into the water has been going on for hundreds of years, and the people with the most impressive underwater abilities are the traditional pearl divers of the Arabian Gulf. They dive the deepest dives, often to depths of more than 130 feet. And look at this next picture. It's a picture of a lady called Sue, Susan Anderson, an artist who uses a wheelchair. And she's created an underwater wheelchair that gives her freedom to dive underwater. Isn't that incredible? And she's even taken part in the diving uh, in the Paralympics. Well, later on this morning, we're going to look at some words from the Bible found in the book of Ezekiel, and it tells us of a man who went into a river. It got deeper and deeper and deeper until he had to swim because the water was so deep. You know, sometimes when we go through life, we feel that we might be going out of our depth when we're in the water. And some of us feel safer with our feet firmly planted on the floor. But in these verses, God was giving us a message of his love and purpose for us. And we know that we can trust him to help us and to keep us safe, to keep us afloat, as it were, in those difficult times. You know, when we go deeper in the water of life, and Jesus is the water of life, we experience his peace, his love, and his joy. And that's reflected in this song, particularly chosen with our young people in mind. But I invite you all to stand as we share in this song. And if you feel inclined to do the actions, then you go right ahead. be seated. I pray that's your experience today, that you've got peace, love and joy deep down in your soul, flowing like a river. Now, General Albert Osborne was inspired to write about the water of life 
in Song 742 in our songbook. And um, the song is, When shall I come unto the healing waters? We're going to listen to a quartet as they sing that song for us. But as they listen, I pray that you too will find refreshment, renewal through the Holy Spirit as the water of life flows over, around, and within you. After we've listened to the song, Sue Haywood will lead us in a time of intercessory prayer. And then it will be time for our young people to leave as they go to their own classes this morning. When shall I come unto the healing waters? Lifting my heart, I cry to thee, my breath. Spirit of peace, my comforter and healer, in whom my springs are found, let my soul be deeper. From a hill I know, healing waters flow. Arise, Emmanuel's tide, and my soul. of secret fear, cleanse our wounds from all birthly for hidden, and when the waters flow, let my healing appear. From a hill I know question as the song did there as the words did there when can I come until the healing waters well of course the answer is any time and for us this morning the answer is now as we pray we're going to bring before God those who are in need of healing the healing may be a physical healing it may be an emotional healing it may be a mental healing or a spiritual healing, but God knows and we believe that God will answer our prayers this morning. In the next few moments, I would like you all to just think of 
That's one or two people who you know who need healing from God. It could be someone from our church. It could be a family member. It could be a friend or a neighbor. There's someone who is known to you. I've made a list of just a few people from um, those in our church that need our healing prayers this morning. The list, of course, isn't an exclusive list because there will be many, many more. But this morning particularly, I bring to God Carol Elliott. And we're so grateful because only yesterday I heard that her, her general well-being is improving, her health is improving. Father, continue to show the improvement in Carol. I think of Major Sylvia Bird. She has now completed uh, a gruelling cancer treatment. Let's pray for a good outcome for Sylvia. David, we pray for Angela. Only a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, she was due to have hip surgery. And at the very last minute, the surgery was called off. How very disappointing. Father, please be with her as she copes with the excruciating pain and as she awaits news of another date of surgery. I bring to God David Shaw, Ruth's husband. We pray for David as he continues his treatment. And then yesterday I heard that Hazel, Ruth's mum, has suffered a severe heart attack, a massive heart attack, and is now in hospital. I pray for Norman Bond as he struggles uh, with his eyesight and his general health. I pray for Audrey Salmon. Dementia is such a dreadful illness. So dear Lord, please be with Audrey with Derek and their family as they cope with this debilitating illness. Be with Keith Marriott, again as he and his family cope with his diagnosis. Be with Harrison Clayton and his family as they cope daily with Harrison's complex and diverse needs. Father, be with Eleanor Rowe, as she needs more tests. She's on strong antibiotics to break the sinus infection that she has. Father, let the medication and the testing be positive and be effective. I, I spoke to two of our um, members here this morning who have concerns about members of their family. So Father, I just bring them to you as well. There are many in our church fellowship who are lonely, who during the last 16 months have been isolated and almost prisoners in their own homes. Father, as we have already said, this isn't an exclusive list. While I have named some from our fellowship, we have all brought someone before you, asking for your healing touch for them. Father, give each one the hope and courage they need for today and for every day. Remove all fear and doubt. Comfort them in their pain, calm their fears, and the surround them with your love and peace. Father God, we ask too that you will be with the medics and the professionals who are treating our friends. Bless the surgeons and the medical staff. Just be with them. May they be extensions of your healing hands. Lord, thank you for being with each one of us through all the ups and downs of our lives and for the many blessings that you have given us. For these we praise you and we thank you. We ask all our prayers in and through the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Sue. And uh, we'll continue to remember as many of those as we can in these coming days. I'm reading from the uh, prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 47. And uh, if you have your Bibles with you and wish to follow, it's Ezekiel 47 from verse 1. Then the very first verse makes reference to a man. And I had to turn back to Ezekiel 40 to find who this man was. Verse 3 says, The man had an appearance like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. And this unnamed man brought Ezekiel to the entrance of the temple. And I, Ezekiel, saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me round the outside to the outer gate facing the east. And the water was flowing from the south side. As the men went eastward with his measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cupids and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through the water that was up to my waist. He measured off another thousand and now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. And when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the sea. And when it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be a large number of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglam. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for the food and their leaves for healing. Amen. Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel has a vision of water flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem. Just ankle deep at first, then up to Ezekiel's knees. Before long, it's a river that no one could cross. The river creates the possibility for trees to grow. And the leaves on these trees will not wither. The trees bear fruit every month and their leaves bring healing to the nations. When the river enters the Dead Sea, it makes the salty water fresh. The sea, which is famous for its lifelessness, suddenly teems with living creatures. Where the river flows, there is life. God's story of love in the world is like this river. It's unstoppable. It brings healing. It's life-giving. 
is not meant to be contained. God has been writing his story of love for you and for me, for people of every culture, every language, every nation. What's amazing is that he longs to write this story through you and me. God is at work in the world, but we are his workers. In Acts 2, in Jerusalem, the river begins to flow through the apostles as they speak in tongues and share the good news with people from lots of different nations. The gospel flows out from Jerusalem as the apostles shared God's love with the nations. And we, as the church, continue this story today. Here comes a song that speaks of that river, the river of life. It's called Down the Mountain the River Flows. And I invite you to stand and enjoy the music, but also take note of the words as we listen and watch this video.
a good song, that, isn't it? It makes you feel as though you want to dance. And maybe some of you at home did actually get up and dance. Didn't see it here, though. Well, you may or may not know that I was raised in the city of Cambridge. My mother still lives there, so I visit often. And um, it's a bit of a tourist city also, as uh, well as being a, a university city, and there's lots of students that live there. But one thing that tourists like to do when they visit the city is to take a punt, which is a flat-bottomed boat and punt down the river cam using a long pole and some manpower to push the punt along the river. The punter actually stands on a little um, ledge at the end of the boat and uh, it's like a little small flat platform. And if you're not uh, a very experienced punter, then you might find yourself taking an unexpected swim in the river. Now, John, in those early days of our courtship, you took me to a spring, if you can remember, which is a claim to be the source of the River Cam. Ah, he does remember. And this little spring grows from its source and flows on through the city of Cambridge, and its force then flows into the River Ouse. Well, this morning's study of the scripture from Ezekiel speaks about the flowing river of God. And as Captain Allen spoke a few weeks ago about fishing, I thought I could speak about swimming. <laughs> and I hope you'll see how it all links together this morning. Because you see, Ezekiel, in chapter 47, tells us of his vision of that river that flowed from the temple and the man who took to swimming in the river. <coughs> you see, if we wanted a title for this morning's sermon, it could be swimming in the river or going deeper in the river. Both the book of Ezekiel and Revelation are not necessarily the easiest books of the Bible to understand, but they both give us picture imagery of the last days when Jesus comes again and the effect of God's Holy Spirit in these days. And I hope we might see the picture of what God is saying to us today through this prophecy. For the river of God is likened to the Holy Spirit and its effect upon those who submerge themselves in Jesus, the water of life. For those of you who are a bit unsure who Ezekiel was, well, he was a prophet of God. He'd been exiled to Babylon with 3,000 Jews from Judah. And if we're to look at the very first chapter of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, it's interesting to note that he was actually, in fact, down by the riverside of the river Kibar with other exiles when he saw a vision from God. Now there are many other visions recorded in the book of Ezekiel, but this morning we're just going to focus on this vision of the river flowing from the temple found in chapter 47. But we must also note that Ezekiel's vision of the flowing river has strong similarities with John's vision that was given many, many years later and is recorded in the book of Revelations, chapter 22. John's revelation does not mention the river flowing from the temple of God, but that the river flows from the very throne of God. You see, in Revelation, there is no need for a temple, for all creation will be as a temple, a sanctuary, where all creation will worship and adore the Lord and declare his holiness. But it speaks about the river of life, the tree of life, and of its fruitfulness and its healing leaves. And this is also seen in Ezekiel's vision all those years earlier. 
It's said that a river has a source where it starts, a course where it flows, and a force, what effect it has. And we've only had to see by looking at the news this past week, this past few days, of those dreadful, devastating floods in Europe. We've seen the powerful force of water, and sadly the devastation that has come in that situation. And we remember our neighbors in Europe in prayer. But the force of the water can also have a good effect. The source of the river in Ezekiel's vision comes from under the, the temple in Jerusalem that is yet to be rebuilt. And this is linked to the words of Jesus in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. He was actually attending the feast of the tabernacles in Jerusalem at the temple, which had by that time been rebuilt by King Herod. And at this feast of tabernacles, there were two particular demonstrations. One was the illumination of the temple. The other was the purification of the temple, which obviously involved lots and lots of water. And water was poured down the temple courtyards, and it became like a flowing river. And Jesus on this occasion said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Because up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not been yet glorified. These same streams of living water that Jesus spoke about, the water of the river that flowed from the altar in the temple in Ezekiel's vision, vision, and the river of life that flows from the very throne of God in Revelation are the same Holy Spirit that brings life and refreshment, renewal, and empowers the Christian. The course in the river in Ezekiel's vision flows eastwards from under the temple. It flowed round from the south of the altar. It flowed out of the city of Jerusalem, out into the Judean wilderness until it reaches Araba, a sandy desert. And then it flowed into the Dead Sea. And the force of the river is remarkable because what began as a trickle of water in a, in a relatively short time in distance, increases in depth. There's a man with a rod measuring the depth of the river every 500 meters or so. He's measuring the depth of the water. It's ankle deep, then knee deep, then waist deep, until the water is too deep for a man to stand. And as the river deepens, it irrigates the desert on either side, and trees grow and produce fruit. They're no ordinary fruit trees, for they produce fruit on a monthly basis, and the leaves are good for healing. The water of life, representing the Holy Spirit, flows into the Dead Sea. That sea then becomes alive, teems with life. The Dead Sea is called dead because it's got such a high concentration of minerals that no plants can grow in it. But the force of this inflow of fresh water is such that the Dead Sea becomes alive with all manner of fish and creatures. And the poignancy of this is that there will be fishermen along its banks, for the Dead Sea will be alive and fruitful. So how do we apply this vision? What's its meaning for us today? Well, Jesus, the water of life, has given us the clue. This refreshing river of living water represents the life-giving Holy Spirit. And Ezekiel's vision of the flowing river is a picture of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. Our experience 
with the Holy Spirit depends upon how much we allow the Holy Spirit to be in control of our lives. Or in other words, how deep, how deep we are prepared to allow ourselves to go into the water of that river of life. Are we paddling in the shallows? Or are we wading right in? Sometimes feeling out of our depth, but relying on the Holy Spirit to keep us afloat, as it were. Well, Ezekiel gives us four levels that we can liken to our experience and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. The man measuring the water in the first vision stepped into the water, and it was around his feet, up to his ankles. He was paddling in the shallows. You get the picture if you just imagine yourselves paddling at the water's edge at the seaside, splashing around in the shallows. It's very tempting on a hot day like today, isn't it? But you see, our feet are our foundation. We stand upon them. They support the frame of the body. And God wants us to be firm-footed on his foundations so that we are firmly supported in our faith. Ever wondered why at times your faith feels a little shaky? It's because our foundation has become a little weakened, perhaps. And the devil knows when we're weakened, when we're wavering, when we're unsure. And that's when he attacks us. We become weakened when our foundations are weakened. However, if we're only paddling in the shallows of the river of life, the Holy Spirit, well, we may not be that strong. In verse 4, the man was up to his knees in water. Now the knee joint causes us to run. And there are those probably amongst us uh, this morning who have or have had problems with your knees. If you've damaged your knees... You cannot run effectively. You have restricted movement of the legs. God wants us to stand firm in the foundations of our faith. He wants us to run with him. He wants us to surrender our lives to him and run to him on knees of prayer. For when we're on our knees, it's a sign that we surrender our all to God. And when we're on our knees in prayer, our faith will be strengthened. In that same verse, verse 4, the man was soon up to his waist in water. Now when you're in the water, up to your waist, you begin to lose control of your body's actions. Have you ever been in the sea, maybe waist deep, and a wave comes rushing along and pushes you over? You can't run anymore at waist depth. You seem unable to use your own strength. God wants us to let go of our own strength and control and offer our lives to him. There's a slogan that Christians have used time and time again, let go and let God. You'll have heard that, I'm sure. And we can use it in any instance or circumstance this morning as we go deeper into the river of life. Let go of all that may be holding you back from full emotion, immersion into that river of life. Let go of your fears and hindrances that prevent you from living life in the full flow of the Holy Spirit. And let God take control. Let him lead and guide you so that you may become fruitful by displaying the fruit of a spirit-filled life. Fruit like love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. For the Bible tells us that it's by our fruit that we shall be known. Well, by the time we get to verse 5, the man is getting deeper and deeper into the waters of the river and is swimming. Because at this depth, our feet can barely touch the bottom, and we have little control of our body unless we're a very strong swimmer. And if we happen to get caught in the current of the river, then we have to go with the flow. We have to let the current carry us along. 
You know, God wants us to be in the very centre of the river of life so that we can move in the flow of the Spirit. We need to be in the centre of his will to experience the fullness of the river, the fullness of living life in the Spirit of God. This is a picture of the Christian who is fully submitted to the will of God in their lives, who lives and moves in the flow of the Spirit. Well, this vision of Ezekiel may be a little hard for us to understand, but it's a picture of the outpouring of the life-giving water of the Holy Spirit and our response to that outpouring in our lives. The challenge to us today is where are we in that river? Are we splashing about in the shallows where the water is just ankle deep? You know, when you go to a leisure pool, um, the water can only be ankle deep at first. It's the area where non-swimmers, even little children can play in safety. But it is possible for little children to enter the deeper waters of the Holy Spirit. But even so, however old we are, some of us choose to stay there at the water's edge where it's safe, where we feel comfortable, where we are in control. But perhaps you've been a little bolder, you've stepped knee deep into that river. However, it's still very tentative because you're really just paddling Although the water's a little bit higher, your feet are still touching the bottom, you're still in control. But then the water's waist deep. It's always difficult getting into the water when you reach that point, but you know, once you've passed that hurdle, you know it's gonna be all right. But even now, you can still be in control because your feet are on the bottom. You're less likely to be carried away but then you're in the water, right up to your neck. <clears throat> you're out of your depth. You have to let the water support you or out you'll drown. And very soon, you're swimming. The current may be too strong to swim against, so why try? Go with the flow of the Spirit. Let the river of life guide you. That's a picture of our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And when you're learning to swim, it's a case of having faith in the water to let it hold and support you. And I say to you today, have faith in God. Have faith in God and the power of the Holy Spirit. He will support you. This is faith, then you can live in the flow of the Spirit. <clears throat> so where are you? Are you still in the shallows? Are you afraid to get out of your depth? Friends, you can trust God's Holy Spirit. He can support you as you go deeper in the river and the knowledge of his love and his grace. If you see yourself as ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and you're still wanting to be in control, you need to surrender fully to the Spirit of God. That is trust. And God can be trusted. Lift your feet off the bottom and swim. Let the flow of the Spirit take you. Don't resist. Let go. And let God. We're all challenged to go deeper into the river of the Holy Spirit because there are new depths, new places to be explored, new experiences to be enjoyed. One final thought. The source of this river flows out from the temple, the dwelling place of the Almighty God. And the further the course of the river flows, the deeper it gets. And with the force of the river, there is more impact 
upon the dry and barren places through which it flows. There is an effect on the land it flows through. There is fruitfulness. There is life. There is and will be and should be a result of our immersing ourselves in an even greater, deeper experience of the Holy Spirit. It is that we might be fruitful. Friends, you're invited to come today to the banks of the river of life, to step in deeper and fully immerse yourself in the river and find that you too can swim in the flow of the Spirit and be fruitful in your life with Christ. I'm going to invite you to listen to a song that can be our prayer this morning, a prayer that we can make for ourselves as we reflect upon this word from Ezekiel this morning. It says, I want to be out of the depth of your love, feeling your arms so strong around me, out of my depth in your love, learning to let you lead, putting all trust in you, deeper into your arms, surrounded by you. Things I've held so tight made my security. Give me the strength I need to simply let go because I want to be out of my depth in your love. to be out of my death in your love, feeling your arms so strong around me, out of my death in your love, out of my depth in you, I want to be out of my death in to let you lead, putting all trust in you, deeper into your arms, surrounded by you, things I have held so tight, made my security. strength I need to simply let go. I want to be out of my depth in your love, feeling your arms so strong around me, out of my depth in your love, out of my depth in I want to be out of my depth in your love, feeling your arms so strong around me, out of my depth in your love, out of my depth. May that have been your prayer this morning, but let us pray together now. Mighty God, river of life, we ask today that we may be in that place, out of depth in your love, feeling your arms so strong around us. Help us to learn to let you lead. Help us to put our trust in you. And those things that hold us back from going deeper with you, help us to let them go, we pray. You may give us the strength to do just that.
We long for you to be in our lives. We want to be submerged completely in your love and power. Yet the cares of this world encourage us not to let go and let God. O oh, Holy Spirit, come and make each heart your home, we pray. Flow through us so we flourish and share the fruit of the Spirit and the love and grace of Jesus with those we meet as the river of life throws through us. In the name of Jesus, water of life, we pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. The founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, certainly knew the experience of being out of his depth in God's love and living in the Spirit. His experience is written in what we know as the, the Founder's Song. It's Song 509 in the Songbook, if we are using the Songbook this morning. And we conclude this morning with a virtual group of Salvationists. They're just going to sing four verses, one, five, six, and seven. But it speaks about being submerged in the love of God, the Holy Spirit flowing through us and over us. Come, mighty Father of love, and um, roll over us. So let's stand as we join in with this song this morning. <coughs> Salvation Army, raise your voices. The Founder's song tells the story of God's boundless salvation, but it won't sing itself.
and it won't be too long before we can sing that for ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Our final prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the time we've spent in worship together. Each of us is unique. Each of us came here with a private world of hopes and fears. Your love has drawn us together as we bathe in the deep ocean of love. Your spirit has given us new hopes, new thoughts, new insights. Help us to live in your love, to share your goodness with others. Some of us may leave with fears to face, with problems unresolved, with pain unremoved. May we also find that this time of worship has brought us new strength and hope and faith. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, who died for us and who lives within us. Amen.